Hi guys, it's Claire Nocti. Welcome back to my channel. Finally, I know it's been forever. Thank you guys for your patience on this video. Today, again, I am back utilizing statistical astrological research. It's a study that I did of the birth time verified charts of a hundred of the world's wealthiest individuals to reveal the cosmic mysteries behind wealth and poverty. I will be exploring and considering in depth today the cosmic forces that animate the individuals who gain maximum wealth and dominate in their particular field financially. And in analyzing the key patterns that arose in this research regarding nakshadras, Rahu and Ketu placements, zodiac signs, house placements, and more, we can see what chart elements are the seeds to abundance and prosperity, and then which ones present themselves as obstacles to those things. Then, using that knowledge and the clear patterns that came up, anyone with any signs, whether your signs show up in this research or not, can remedy their chart or even just their mindset and behaviors accordingly to mirror these very successful archetypes in order to experience personal financial growth. The most prominent placements that arose in this study form a shocking picture of what truly supports wealth. In what one might think would be like a lighthearted dive into luxury and abundance and indulgence, the data supported and encouraged contemplation of the smoky forces of poverty, dryness, emptiness, jealousy, betrayal, and darkness, and how the secret to wealth really lies in the utilization and control of these dark forces. most important singular placement in any individual's chart is traditionally the moon because the moon rules the mind and the senses and the emotions amongst other things and moon placement is something that naturally arose as exaggerated in the study so while some of the different placements came out you know evenly spaced between all 100 individuals moon placement was something that really leaned toward especially one moon nakshatra and so it's definitely a key consideration for wealth interestingly jeshta nakshatra was the top placement for moon where moon is debilitated as well as the top spot for k2 the south node according to parasharas jesta here in scorpio is actually the exaltation Rashi for K2. So now I'm going to explore Jeshja's overarching nature and how it's such a useful nakshatra as a moon or K2 placement for cultivating major wealth. Jeshja nakshatra is traditionally in many ways considered the opposite of abundance. Associated with Alakshmi, the dry and impoverished, jealous elder sister of Lakshmi, who is associated with the opposite nakshatra of abundance, Rohini and Taurus. Lakshmi is always accompanied by her sister Alakshmi, who can be found in imagery as the owl that is near her or that she's riding. What is found though in contemplation is that the hungry, desirous, and jealous nature of Alakshmi with a dark, spacious, void-like energetic reservoir is much more conducive to achievement as a moon placement than, for example, the internally stable and satisfied placements such as Rohini. Alakshmi is correlated to the goddess called Jeshta, and in the mantra Mahodadi, it's said that the smoky widowed Mahavijja Dumavadi, she is the same as the goddess Jeshta. Alakshmi's name means literally without Lakshmi or without wealth and abundance. And she's said to love spicy and sour foods, just like how Lakshmi, the goddess of abundance, loves sweet foods. Sour foods correlate to poverty, and Jishta is the eater of poverty. And essentially, it removes it with her desirous and consuming nature and then inflicts it on others. Alakshmi is said to be crafty, quarrelsome, skillful, and never satisfied. To be extremely wealthy in this way, you can't be satisfied with simple or common achievements. You can't be satisfied with $10,000 or $100,000 or even a couple million dollars. Or not going out of your way to rise to the top and destroy your competition. Watch a primary way that you would ever go about doing these things is if you were never satisfied and had tendencies towards jealousy and to conquer simply for the sake of doing so. I 
I discussed in my previous video about mercury dominant men or my video on Jishta nakshatra, that this is the nakshatra in my research of more true achievers in any technical skill-based field than any other. People who cultivate skill to the level that it's truly inimitable. Here again was the very voice of God. I was staring through the cage of those meticulous ink strokes at an absolute beauty. So they conquer over all competition and arise out of the masses, which masses are lunar, like just as opposite the moon rolled Rohini. This is also why the goddess Dumavati is said to give you a preference for being alone if you worship her. Her tendency is to help you learn how to triumph over others. A really important thing to consider with Jishta is that you reap what you sow. I've talked about before that Jishta natives, being in Scorpio and as a debilitated moon placement, are so heated and hot that they cannot hold any energy within them, which you could correlate to semen, literally and metaphorically, which is why Jishta Nakshatra is the rabbit yoni, symbolizing that they hop around a lot that they're always discharging. This is also why Alakshmi is said to make men single due to the heat that she creates, which is the discharging heat of Scorpio, the eighth house. This heat helps with manifesting in the material world, which is again why the goddess Dumavati fixes Ketu issues and Ketu is exalted here in Scorpio, because Ketu is the planet that causes a person to withdraw from making external impressions and causes a person to lose material wealth through the kind of drawing inward stagnation that Ketu creates, but instead she churns this energy of Ketu so that it does not become that way. Jeshja Nakshatra natives end up discharging in an energetic sense all the time in a very directed way towards a certain goal or a certain skill which all of that energetic direction plants a ton of those seeds in the earth around them this then causes them to reap a big financial harvest as the earth rewards those with material success who fecundate and plant energy and directive force within her that that's what nature wants and craves dumavati is related to unmanifest and essentially infertile space because it will not hold anything that's placed within it well, Bhuvaneshwari, for example, the Mahavidya that I've correlated to Swati Nakshatra in my previous video, relates to manifest and fertile space that holds what's given and amplifies that. And both of these have to do with wealth, and I'm going to talk about Swati a little later. Just individuals are energetically like a dry void, being the moon's debilitation, first of all, and therefore lacking stability or internal nourishment, never truly internally full or satisfied, always discharging and perpetually emptying because this next chapter is associated with this solar pingala nadi meanwhile the exaltation of the moon in taurus with rohini is not as conducive to wealth and is contrastingly one of the lowest placements because there we find internal abundance natives who are focused on constant absorption without any discharge due to passivity and seeking stability. In Taurus and Rohini especially, abundance builds up very quickly and therefore cosmically the energy of Rohini isn't seeking much outwardly. Nothing outward really truly phases the internal abundance that they already possess. So gesture natives are discharging constantly and therefore planting things around them to grow while at the exact same time all that discharging makes them internally empty so they attract more from around them like a vacuum it's like how rohini having internally and bodily abundance then tend to have less wealth because their external environment is more dry because they don't attract abundance towards themselves since that's more so what they embody you can even see this in the women of each nakshatra because studying the women of a nakshatra tends to reveal its manifest nature they embody the shakti of each nakshatra personified as i've explored in my personal research on astrological physiognomy Rohini women tend to be quite full in bodily tissues, while Jeshta women are in my research typically some of the shortest, thinnest, and tiniest overall, storing the least abundance. So people say, why are you so skinny? Do I starve myself? I don't starve myself. When you see me in person and you see, okay, she's skinny, you'd be like, okay, that makes sense because... I'm very short, I'm five one. I've noted that they also tend to emphasize dryness in their appearance, enjoying to cultivate a kind of worn, experienced, and rough appearance, such as purposefully emphasizing freckles, frazzled hair, bodily thinness, and things like that. 
Furthermore, Jeshta Nakshatra is the eldest, the position where you're at the top of whatever you're doing. Indra is a god of this nakshatra, being the top of this world in the sense of the ruler of the gods. And Jeshta's special power is Arohana Shakti, to rise and conquer. So Jeshta is essentially the pinnacle of material development and domination over the mundane in both literal skill and wealth, as well as material knowledge. It's the end point of the mid stage of nakshatras. There are three stages of the nakshatras, and Jeshta finishes the second stage. Mula nakshatra, the nakshatra that follows, is then where things become more ethereal and transcendent in the final stage. The letter of Jeshta Nakshatra is Daha. In the Varnashishka, a text which describes the qualities of the Sanskrit letters, it explains that the letter Daha is wealth bestowing and facilitates your ability to accomplish a goal. Dumavadi is said to destroy enemies and also eliminate poverty, which are matters of the sixth house. She does so with Danada Shakti, the Shakti of the letter Daha. When you worship her, it makes you like her and like gesture natives, always unsatisfied, always overcoming your own weaknesses and limitations, and so reaching new heights in your own abilities. Dumavadi and Jayasta, they excel at breaking up tamasic energy, which is why they say she helps with Ketu issues. Ketu is extremely tamasic, meaning he's inert, relating to the mode of ignorance, lethargy, and darkness. So one is prone to that kind of behavior in the area of their Ketu, or if their K2 is weak in general. As I said, Rohini Nakshatra is the exaltation of the moon because it's where you're really satisfied internally, internally rich, very stable, even if you have nothing and even if you're in ignorance, which is why K2 is considered bad here in Taurus. It can signify satisfaction and contentment with stagnation before you have truly achieved or obliterated your own internal weaknesses and ignorance. To be liberated, you have to work tirelessly, which is what Jishta does, and engage in that Scorpio transformation, breaking up your tamasic nature and your ignorance with those heated, transformative energies of the eighth house. You can't break up tamas, the mode of darkness and ignorance, with only sattva, the mode of purity, because sattva won't break it up. You actually have to use those heated rajas, the mode of creativity and passion and action, to break up tamasic things, so then you can call in sattvas and not have impurity. Jishya nakshatra, like the owl associated with this nakshatra, can see through Ketu's darkness and function even under these heavy dark energies, revealing the hidden treasures of reality, as K2 is said to do. This is also why I've said before that Jishya natives often sleep very little too, because sleep is the tamoguna, and the natural state of the Jishya native internally is just to never rest. Rahu, however, does really well in Rohini, because the function of Rahu is to, first of all, delude and promote ignorance, because Rahu is Maya, and the job of Maya is to conceal the truth. What you can consider in the Mrigashira Nakshatra video that I did, where at the beginning I explain how Rohini and Taurus are the Garden of Eden, where there's no distinction or duality, whereas Ketu is the liberator, and his job is to reveal the truth. Also, if you think about how unstable Rahu is and how dispersive Rahu is in nature, Taurus is that amazing stabilizer for Rahu's dispersive nature. Either way, it confirms the scriptures in correlation to the sidereal zodiac, where people traditionally understood that the specific Rashi axis of Scorpio and Taurus is the key to understanding material wealth and how it's obtained, which is why this axis is the one that's correlated with Lakshmi and Alakshmi. To sum up this consideration of Jishta, there's a specific tale that I feel really shows the power of this nakshatra really clearly, which I'll briefly explain. And I really recommend you watch this part because it'll illustrate it to you in a more mythical way, so it can kind of linger with your unconscious mind a little bit better. It was originally a story called All Gold Canyon by Jack London. This particular short film stars Tom Waits, a Jishta ascendant native. He's hunting for gold and he enters this beautiful natural landscape, singing a song about an old gray-haired, wrinkled woman, Mother McCree, much like the goddess Jeshda or Dumavati, the widow. Which, so interestingly, I found out that this old song was written by a Jeshda moon native. The land he finds is untouched, beautiful, far away, and isolated, like a Garden of Eden, which again relates to the opposite nakshatra, Rohini. Oh God bless you and keep you, Mother McCree. When he's camping and climbs a pine tree, the tree that's traditionally correlated to Jeshta, to find eggs to eat, and he sees four eggs. 
he sees an owl staring at him, the symbol of a Lakshmi, who is known as Jayashtha, perched in a tree. And from seeing this mother owl, he puts back three eggs begrudgingly, but respectfully, and takes just one. He knows that those eggs belong to her, he knows that he didn't really work for them, and he doesn't feel right taking something that doesn't truly belong to him. But he takes one just saying, Oh, maybe just one. How high can a bird count anyway? So all at once, we find a Jeshta native singing a Jeshta native song about a Jeshta goddess with a Jeshta tree and a Jeshta animal. Finally, later, after spending days digging for this gold and using methods that he's cultivated through his own experience, determining where he would find the gold, he finally finds it. Just as he finds it, He sees a shadow over him and he realizes that someone has been following him, watching him, and trying to let him do the work of finding and digging for the gold and is going to steal it from him. So this enemy comes to shoot the old Jeshda man and steal that gold. First of all, worshipping Dumavadi or Jeshda or having this energy naturally gives you the power to rise above perils and people who try to steal from you. This next chapter is associated with protection being symbolized by the umbrella and by the protective talisman. She's able to protect the person by becoming like the symbol of her nakshatra, the umbrella. Vampiric and parasitic individuals who try to come in and take something that you've put tons of time and energy into, etc. And steal something that they haven't cosmically earned. She protects you from those people who will always arise the more and more that you achieve in your life. Because he took one egg that didn't belong to him, in a sense, the story implies that the enemy was able to shoot him. But it's implied in the story that it was because he didn't take all the eggs and respected the more negative force of nature personified as the owl and tried to take only what belonged to him, that he was able to overcome this enemy, this thief who didn't respect these cosmic laws of nature at all, who wanted to let an experienced old man do all the work for him and then take it all away. Let me do all the work and shoot me in the back! There's a notable emphasis on smoke surrounding the old man when he attacks his enemy, and it's an interesting note that Dumavati is the smoky goddess. The owl appears staring at the now dead thief, showing her influence there, and then the Jeshta man buries his attacker instead and leaves with his deserved wealth. Jeshta is where you yourself dig, work, find the treasure yourself, and have the right to it in a cosmic sense. Jeshta natives are unsatisfied until they develop the capacity to achieve things themselves. They only want to succeed through their own efforts, and they won't be satisfied stealing from others. For that reason, the harsh force of nature is protective over them, and they earn its respect, and it rewards them. Sure, I love the dear silver that shines in your hair, and the brow that's all for all and wrinkled with care. I kiss the dear fingers so time won't fall. Another major theme in the story is the concept of how you view nature. The film and book both emphasize the beauty of the landscape that the gold miner seems to completely ignore. He calls out to hey, and Mr. only addresses Pocket. Mr. Pocket, right. the pocket of gold that he's searching for, it. ignoring the treasure of the landscape as a whole, whereas it's contrasted that others might see the land itself as such beauty that it shouldn't be touched. Good night, Mr. Pocket. Sit tight, Mr. Pocket. 
This is a perfect contrast of Rohini and Jeshta. When you're really under Rohini cosmically, the Garden of Eden, you're very under a stagnant kind of illusion that tells you or makes you feel that things are perfect as they really are because you're happy with what you see and you're happy with what's already there. So you're not necessarily able to overcome and mine gold out of nature and become a king, which is Jishta, which disregards the stagnation. Being in that tumultuous and transformative Scorpio, always looking to see how it can cause transformation that benefits him rather than the stable and abundant Taurus. In the Rohini cosmic stage, you're more so a servant to an admirer of nature, not choosing to realize the power in shaping it and directing it respectfully, but more so worshiping it and even allowing it to conceal the truth from you. Like Adam and Eve before they ate the fruit to wake up from the illusory Garden of Eden where they had no concept of good or evil or free will. The Garden of Eden is a blissful state even if it is a state that is a bit stagnant and doesn't possess the knowledge that comes through hardship. So Jishta natives will forcefully cultivate nature and pour their seed into it. While I describe in the MMA survey video that I did, the way that Rohini more so withholds their seed, even in the sense of semen. And so these forces of poverty and stagnation and smoke, personified by the owl in the story, respect and protect Jishta and allow its skillful and desirous natives to prosper. Being opposite of Rohini and Taurus, the second house called Dana Bhava, just exchanges and interacts abundantly with the second house matters of sensorial stability and financial stability. While Rohini natives, they more so embody those qualities in their actual internal and bodily nature. Personally, I have never seen as many partnerships in my research as Jishta Rohini partnerships. These forces of abundance and desire, they come together with extreme polarity and magnetism on both a personal and cosmic level. Rohini is the generative force of nature. Whoever gives as Jishta does, she gives back her bounty. Again, Jishta being associated with Indra is also associated with kings. In Indian alchemy, a disease is spoken about called royal consumption, which is said to occur to kings from the influence of Rohini Nakshatra. What this disease is, is that because kings have to supply their energy to many different women or lunar beings, they often become burned and emaciated from the cosmic like yonis feeding off of them. Jeshta people become very rich because they don't hesitate to give to those yonis that are hungry and so the earth rewards them and every man really is on the spectrum somewhere further under the influence of either Rohini or Jayesta either he's feeding a lot of people or he's feeding off of a lot of people and so it's key to note that ultimately the king both benefits his people but is also a servant to his people. Then it's interesting to contemplate the lowest moon placement which was Uttara Ashada because this next chapter also has an important relationship with Rohini. Uttara Ashada is quite different to Jeshta. It's not polarized to be exchanging with the feminine Rohini but it's the enemy Yoni of Rohini being the mongoose that hates the snake Yoni and resists interaction with those second house forces of Rohini and Rigashira. Uttara Ashada, as I've discussed before, and will of course more in the Uttara Ashada Nakshatra video, is the ultimate Nakshatra of male camaraderie and even standing up against the feminine force of nature to the point of victimizing or abusing it. The height and refinement of sun, as Uttara Ashada is the final sun ruled Nakshatra, is attracted to withdrawing from or overcoming lunar female energies in general in favor of interaction with males and cultivation of independence. And so they don't cultivate that excess abundance at all that comes from exchange with the feminine forces of reality. So Jeshta is one of the three Mercury ruled Nakshatras, which now brings me to the next point, that if you had to choose a single planet that threads together many elements elements of wealth in this research, that planet would be Mercury. First I'm going to do a brief overview of the thread of Mercury, and then I will briefly touch on each element. Okay, so just to help emphasize the mercurial stuff going on here, I'm going to just review real quick that Moon was top in the Mercury rolled nakshatra of Jeshta, and that Ketu was also top in the Mercury rolled nakshatra of Jeshta. Then, the top Mercury placement was the exalted sidereal Mercury placement in Hasta Nakshatra. And not only that, but Mercury was most frequently placed in the natural house of Virgo, despite what sign it was in. So Hasta's Rashi, the sixth house. 
So this also ties to how Dumavadi is said to help with sixth house issues, and Mercury and Hasta are the natural associations of the sixth house, which is the house of debts and overcoming enemies, so being shrewd in the area of material issues and dominating over the material world. So then Hasta Moon was also on the second tier of top moons, tied with Punarasu, which is in Gemini and bridges Cancer. So the mixture of Moon and Mercury in Hasta, because Hasta is a moon world nakshatra, but it's in a Mercury world Rashi, it's no surprise if you consider that the Moon is the planet of the masses and commonness, and Mercury is the planet of skill and manipulation. It's understood that these people know how to manipulate the money of the masses into their own pocket, which I talk about a lot in my video on Hasta Nakshatra, as these people being true controllers and manipulators of the masses. Another confirmation of this interplay of Moon and Mercury leading to wealth is that the top Venus placement was by far in Ashlisha Nakshatra, which is the flipped rulership of Hasta. It's also a combo of Moon and Mercury energies because it's in the Moon world Cancer Rashi, but it's a Mercury world Nakshatra. Venus in Ashlisha gives these natives a passion for and an understanding of the base energies that drive the masses. They have a basic understanding of the roots of human greed. This gives them the passion and understanding that they need to exploit that to achieve abundance, as well as, because Venus indicates the spouse, this indicates having a spouse that is a certain type of controlled, cold energetic nature that allows the wealth to accumulate and not to flow out. Ashlisha rules the ability to bind and restrict and withhold your energy, so this is why it's associated with greed in general. So if you really want wealth and you want the highest chance of getting wealth, you want to minimize control and manipulate the moon energies of your life and increase the mercury energies. If you think about another interesting graph of moon in the second house having not a single billionaire whatsoever, the second house is what you accumulate. So people with moon in the second, they accumulate a lot of moon common energy. Moon energy is the enemy of Mercury. It's the only thing that Mercury really dislikes. Mercury is skill. Mercury is cities, whereas moon is commonness and so there's an antithetical nature there. If you want money, you have to excel, rise out, and manipulate those abundant energies of the moon, like how Jishta interacts with the Rohini. You have to manipulate those common and crude, unshaped masses associated with the moon. Interesting too that another thing was the most common planets to be placed in the second house or on the top tier of planets was Venus and Jupiter. And further reinforcing that, Jupiter was also most commonly placed in the natural second house, which is Taurus Rashi. Taurus is accumulation, and these benefic planets of Venus and Jupiter being in the second clearly show that accumulating these natural auspicious energies of just general abundance and prosperity are powerful for wealth. The other nakshatras that are good for extreme wealth are shown in the next bit of data, but first of all, the nakshatra that was the top placement for the Lagna was Pushya, for the Sun was Swati, and these both combined were top all together when I mean, you combine all three primary placements. Then on the second tier of the combined chart were Punarasu and Jeshta. All of these nakshatras relate in some way to space and growth, as I'm going to explore now. The deity of Pushya is Brihaspati, Jupiter, and Jupiter is the planet that radiates more energy than he receives, so his natural tendency is to just constantly expand internally, to accumulate and store more and more, and just have this huge abundance to continue to give to others. So if you have this nakshatra, then in this way you become like him. Pushya is also the natural house of Cancer, which rules the masses. And then this is the Saturn ruled nakshatra, so it brings discipline. And interestingly, Saturn's most common placement in this survey was in sidereal Libra, exalted. So it's amazing how we saw three top sidereal exaltations in this survey, Ketu, Mercury, and Saturn. And then Pushya is said to be the most auspicious nakshatra altogether, so having this as your ascendant is just a good indicator for wealth, which I won't explore too much more than that, as I'm sure most people who are familiar with this nakshatra really aren't surprised. Next, I touched on the way that Punarasu Nakshatra and Swati Nakshatra both relate to space in my most recent video on Swati Nakshatra in the modern world. Swati Nakshatra is so powerful for wealth because, as I have often explained, Swati is the most yin of all nakshatras in a positive sense. It's the manifest aspect of space, like how gesture relates to the unmanifest one. 
that is nourishing and that holds and amplifies the energy that you put into it. I've tied Swati to Bhuvaneshwari, who is the Mahavidya form of ADT, the goddess of Punarvasu. So Punarvasu is much like Swati, but relates to the space of this particular universe, while Swati relates to the principle of the mechanism to use space to hold and hypnotize. Having Swati means that you have a lot of space and that you'll take in a lot of material abundance, which is why it is Rahu mixed with Venus in regards to rulership. Swati natives are very extremely fixated on harmony, regulation, going with the flow, and sensual pleasures. Because it's in Libra, it has a mindset of equilibrium, which is the essence of power and success. This is why out of the Rahu nakshatras, it's the only divine one, because to fixate on harmony and balance is very auspicious. If you don't have enough space, you can't soak in and absorb the wealth. These individuals of the movable nakshatras of Swati and Punarvasu have so much space that they just have some of the biggest natural spheres of being able to soak in and then amplify wealth with their very nourishing internal space, which is why Bhuvaneshwari is, for example, associated with massive windfalls of wealth. And also, Bhuvaneshwari is said to fix moon problems. So if you worship Swati, it improves your moon, and so this again ties to the healing or perfection of moon energies rather than accumulation of them. And then also if you think about coral reefs, coral being a symbol of Swati, they grow very broad and large over time and this is how Swati accumulates and controls to build up more momentum slowly over time. And these qualities of regularity and equilibrium is why Saturn is exalted here in Libra because he is the regulator and the emblem of control. So contrary to what you might think, you might think that you have to be full of auspicious and abundant natural energies to have wealth. But oftentimes what you really want to be is empty and dry, like the void of jeshta, which can never be fulfilled. Or you want to be empty and vast, like the devotional fertile space of Swati and Punarvasu. So with those three nakshatras, considering that space has both the power to nourish and hold everything like Swati and Purnavasu or to consume everything like Jayashta, or you want to be endlessly expansive internally like Pusha. You then want to take this internal emptiness or space, this vacuum-like nature, and you want to become shrewd with it, finding ways to twist reality and pull in energy shown again by that exalted Mercury in Hasta, Mercury's most common placement in the sixth house, Venus and Ashlesha being the top, and Ketu and Jeshta, which Ketu there shows that you have a naturally shrewd and motivated instinctual nature and past life knowledge. When you as an energetic being are dry and heated, you attract and pull on things that are abundant and juicy. But when you're abundant internally, you attract draining, dry, heated forces that relieve you from that pain of having too much. To become rich, it actually involves making yourself a lot like a yoni, hot, empty, spacious, and consuming, and not necessarily naturally abundant and fulfilled like Rohini or phallic like Uttara Shada. Saturating yourself in these dark, dry energies actually leads you to more wealth. The goddess of poverty and transcending duality actually makes you the wealthiest. If instead of running from her into ignorance, you embrace all hardships and are truly meticulous in, in, in eliminating all of your defects and weaknesses that are actually the cause of poverty, diving into the darkness to turn transformation and discover its hidden treasures, you become foundationally fixed in the truest essence of real stability like Lakshmi riding on and intelligently controlling the dark forces of nature and poverty, and then nothing and no one can take it away from you as you have become a master of yourself. I've also started a Patreon page where you can support my channel, and what I'm hoping to do with that Patreon is always have a little like extra page or two of stuff that I've taken out of my videos to give to the members of my Patreon. So, so almost every video will have a little extra something for the people who support my Patreon. And for this video in particular, I'm going to be uploading a document on there that shows a bunch more of the graphs that you can pour through, some of the ones that I wasn't able to touch on in this video or discuss, so you can check out a ton more of the placements and what the results were. Sometimes when I make these videos, people can become confused on how to take the philosophical understandings and apply them to their charts practically. And if you're interested in working with me, 
I would love to take a look at your chart and help you figure out in what field or with what kind of behavior or with what spiritual practice you will find the highest potential for financial growth. And you can check that out on my services page. If you have a recommendation for another astrological research study, let me know your ideas in the comment section below. Please don't forget to share this video and to give it a thumbs up. All right, so see you next time. Thank you.